here with Lisette Feliciano, uh, writer, director of uh, Women is Losers. Um, your film is such a funny and passionate and playful story that manages to uh, convey its uh, messages with a, a lot of heart and humor. And um, that's the best way I think to deliver an agenda is through uh, creativity. A little bit, so, of, a bit of medicine with a lot of sugar. Exactly. So yeah, that's the that's the first thing that I wanted to ask about is just um, the you have such a unique voice in this film, and I think it really um, delivers on its uh, themes and subject matter in a way that um, not many films have before it. So I'm I'm kind of curious how you came to this fourth wall breaking style and the kind of tongue in cheek uh, narration that happens. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. I, I took a big swing, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I'm glad to hear that it's connecting um, for some people, which is, you know, obviously we all had hoped for. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of built, baked into the narrative, um, just in the structure of how to even make this movie. So many times, it, it serves two devices, right? Like obviously it's, it's talking about our limitations, but also it's trying to break the fourth dimension as much as the fourth wall, because yes, these characters are in 1960s, but they're walking around in 2021. Um, and that's purposeful. That's, you know, the things that whenever they drop character and they speak directly to the audience, it's, it, it's almost like they're speaking, like 2021 people are speaking to you at that point. Um, and for our female characters in particular, so often I, it seems like women are asked to put on a smile and just brave a lot of microaggressions at them with, with this, right? So I was interested, and Lorenza did this so brilliantly as, as people are starting to, to see, um, I was interested in what happens when we get an internal dialogue with what they're actually dealing with, what they're going through, right? So when we ever we have those moments, it's to say the unwritten rules of society out loud. That was the purpose of, of, of that. And some people know those rules straight up, and some people don't, right? So it's it's um, it plays with tone. The film you you said tone beautifully. Uh, the film plays with tone because these characters' lives play with tone. Like people in this world people of color in America, we have, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of, you know, there's moments of joy and there's moments of real sadness. And there's moments where you have to go and look at the other person in the room, like, did you just hear what I heard, you know? Um, so that's the, the, the playfulness within the tone, the, the mixed tone is baked into the structure of the story for that reason. Right. And it, it kind of uh, amplifies how obvious these things should be to the audience in a way that, you know, similar to like the big short, how that movie breaks the fourth wall to convey yeah. uh, stuff about an industry you probably don't know about versus yeah. your film is educating people on misogyny and uh, the, the history of inequity and inequality in the United States. And it's, it's almost, uh, it's like, it's very ironic that um, this is both something you have to educate audiences on and uh, no, that just that. It's ironic that you have to educate audiences about it. Thank you. And I, you know, I love my audience. I trust my audience very much, which is why we, you know, we have that pregnancy scene where she goes through in 15 seconds, right? So it's it like the structure of the film um, from the beginning to the middle to the end is very much going like, okay, guys, you, you know what's going on. Like you, she's a person of color, she's pregnant, she's a single mom. Like we know all those big things already. So, but now we're gonna try and talk to you about the, the things that you probably know in your heart, but haven't been said before. Your lead actor is Lorenza Izzo, right? That's her name. She is incredible. Um, brilliant she's brilliant she's and brilliant. um also i felt like all the supporting characters were really well written too they felt very full and flawed but um 
you know, they weren't caricatures. A lot of them kind of had good intentions, even um, in their worst moments. Yeah, um, thank you for that. That was important to us. Especially I liked um, uh, Minerva and Gilbert who had those role reversals where you kind of think one's the ally, one's not, and then they flip flop a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about your writing inspiration just for crafting those types of characters. Um, a lot from my own life. Gilbert and Minerva are partly inspired by um, people who I've, I know, and the people who were in my mother's life. My mother is the main inspiration for this movie. Um, and the movie came about on a conversation with her where I, I kind of came, came to her and said, mom, I think something's going on in, the, in my industry that doesn't have to do with my work ethic and all the things like immigrant moms tell you, work hard, you know, keep your head down and, and just, you know, don't complain. And I was doing all that, nothing was working. And I had to like really shamefully come to her and go, Mom, I'm doing everything, it's not working. What's happening? And she, I don't know what, I, I, I guess she just saw it in my face, um, but she just told me, she sat me down and she really talked to me about what she went through in the 60s and 70s, which I had no idea about, and I'm her daughter. So that was really eye-opening to me. Um, and so in crafting the story, like we were talking about people in her life, right? And so many of the people in her life were people also in my life still, like 50 years later, um, in my own version of, of this, this American dream struggle. <laughs> um, so with Gilbert particularly, who's played brilliantly by Simu Liu, um, and I have to give it to him so much that he, he really embraced like a really tough topic, right? Which is how do you portray a bad guy who's not a bad guy right on the on the on the surface right you, you portray a bad guy who's presenting himself as an ally which is much more dangerous and over and like subvert um and then what happens when they transgress and how do they come back from that right so there's a lot of there was a lot of conversations that Simo and I had to have in terms of the subtlety that we were trying to go for with his character um and and I really gave it to him because he really owned it and he went through his own journey of discovery um, within these subtleties that I think you know he'll talk about uh, on its own. And then um, Minerva is actually my aunt. <laughs> and my aunt is totally Minerva. She is on the surface like a hard ass, but she it's it's a it's an earned, it's an earned uh, um it's an earned shield, right? Because Minerva is dealt with, I mean, we don't have time to deal, to go through this in the movie, which is why I want to make this into a, into a TV show. Um, but she goes into the movie, she, she has this moment where you just realize that she's been in this world and for, in the patriarchal world for a long time and she's been trying to survive herself and her way of surviving is to be very guarded. And that really resonated with me. Um, and I hope it's resonating with, with some of our audience members but just because she's guarded and she's cautious um, and it might come off as prickly, it doesn't mean she's not paying attention to what's happening. And so when she turns around to support um, Lorenza, I, I see it from, from the beginning of it, right? Like she's trying to support her from the very beginning. Like she says, okay, go take your lunch break early, right? She's, she's, she's annoyed because she's doing her job. I think she realized when she busts into the room to tell Gilbert that he has a phone call, like there's no phone call. She, she knows what's happening and she's trying to protect her. She even tells her, be careful. Like in her own way, it, Minerva is the whisper network to me, right? The whisper network that so many women have used to survive for so long, um, where you just check in and go, what are you not saying? What, should I stay away? Should I not stay away? And that, I wanted to bring that to life with Minerva's character and Liza <laughs> Will did that incredibly. She's like, she's like an amazing, she's, you know, she's, she's pine-sized, but I, she's so powerful. And I relate to that because I'm pine-sized. Um, so yeah, she just lights up the screen and she came in and was like, it was cool for everybody for her to come in. Um, you mentioned you want this to be a TV series. So uh, what, okay, what's your, yeah. what's your dream scenario? How would you adapt this onto the TV screen? Oh my goodness, there's so many things that we didn't get a chance to really delve into here. Like there's a whole storyline here with Mateo and you know the traumas that he's dealing with coming back from the Vietnam War, which was a very crushing moment for, the scene was a very crushing moment for our, our country and for our, our, our men where you know we were 
this unveiling that maybe we weren't the good guys. And what does that mean? All at the same time <laughs> that the women's liberation movement is happening. And it's, it's interesting, like the um, Stephen Bowers character and Brian Craig character are basically mirrors of each other and from different generations, right? So where Brian Craig's character is trying to unlearn these preconceived notions of masculinity, um, Bauer is so entrenched in them, uh, the, the Don Juan character's name, um, is so entrenched in them that only when he's completely drunk can he connect with his vulnerability and his, and his hidden wounds, right? Like it's almost like society has failed him in his own way. And so Brian Craig's character is at a point in this story where the rules are being sort of rewritten and he doesn't know where to fall in them. I think he finds his way, he makes a decision to be an engaged father, um, which we're hearing so many messages about that now, but back then, you know, that wasn't the norm. It didn't seem like that was the norm. And I think it, I'm really excited for, for a young man to see his character because it is a choice to be an engaged father, um, to, to engage in fatherhood. That's, that's a choice that I think a lot of young men have to decide if they're gonna be a part of that or not gonna be a part of that. Um, so that would be you know one major storyline. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot more politics in in careers and industries that we didn't get to touch on. You know there's a whole you could have a whole conversation about um, women of color and how they're treated in the medical field, right? We're, we're starting to hear those conversations now, um, and really just like like there's so much. I think history and context that we might purposefully not be educated on about what America was really like in this time period for women. Um, and you're seeing that now with the, the, the rules, the, some of the things that are getting passed, right? Like, I think it was at Texas like two weeks ago did made abortion uh, a penalty by death, right? And it's like, it's almost like we forgot that there was a time period in America where every hospital in America had a septic ward. Sepsis being a blood, um, a very deadly blood uh, blood infection that happens from happened a lot from botched abortions because laws don't make it don't make it stop. They just make it dangerous, um, and it just feels like we haven't been talking about that or that that was news to me. Right, the conversation my mother was like. Oh, this was all legal back then, right? There was maternity leave wasn't even a thing. It wasn't even considered, right? My mother had a, a letter from her boss um, basically notifying her that her two weeks vacation were up, right? But congratulations on your son. And I was like, what do you mean your two weeks vacation are up? She goes, yeah, I had to go back after two weeks. I was like, what? And she's, I was like, didn't you have a C-section? She goes, yeah. But what was I supposed to do? You just have to do it. And like, that's an abdominal surgery. They cut your, your stomach open and then put everything back together and cut through an abdominal wall. And so many women in America have less than two months now, right? It's not two weeks anymore, it's two months to heal from something that medically is six to eight months, if, if not longer. And it's just insane. Like that everything that's happening in the 60s is still happening now. It's just not legal on paper anymore, but the ramifications are still the same or it appears to still be the same. Um, so we can, I'm very passionate about this. We could talk about this forever, but in short, I have, there's no lack of story for a series here. Definitely not. You've, uh, you've opened up, uh, this intergenerational dialogue kind of, uh, inspired by what you talked about with your mom and then your experiences that paralleled hers and throwing kind of the anachronistic moments of character or slang into the movie allows mm -hmm. you to kind of, uh, convey that to a modern audience like you were saying both the things that have changed or maybe haven't changed at all in the yeah. the years since yeah yeah Absolutely. so that um in in that uh realm what do you, what conversations are you hoping that uh this film will um uh, inspire uh within the film industry or the the world at large Oof, that's a big one. Um, you know, you all you always hope for staying power. You always hope that this is something that people are uh, people are referencing 30, 40 years from now. Like that's a dream. I hope that the film gives the audience members space to consider their position, regardless of where your position is. Like, I, you know, I think the film doesn't allow you to look away from what your position is doing 
to some very real people, you know, some very young girls, essentially. And sometimes it seems like we forget that behind all of the slogans and the, the clickbait, there's real young women, you know, young girls, not even, like, you know, yes, there's women, there's, there's young girls who are trying to figure out a lot of things that aren't being said to them, but they're feeling. Um, so I think if we can just look at the humanity behind the slogans, right? I think that'd be really, I, I, would, I, I would feel like I had done my job, like the film purposefully shows you these stereotypes and then tries to turn them on their head to say like, there are people behind this. There are actual people with names who have gone through a lot of, who are go going through, have to, you know, once these laws are passed, there are people who have to deal with the ramifications of, of that. Um, and in my research of the time period and, you know, how we got to even Roe v. Wade as, as, a, as, a, as a law, which is where we end the movie, it's, it seems like it was a lot of women at the time period, of the time period coming forward and in the courtrooms. And they came forward with their stories and they said, you, 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 I think there was one interview that was really heartbreaking. She, you know, this woman stands up in the court in New York City. When they were, like New York City was one of the first states to, um, to, to legalize. You know, she comes up and she says, you guys are killing us. You're killing us. Um, and that really, really hurt to hear um, and to know that like that's that was the feeling for so many women back then. And I just don't feel like that feeling has been honored enough. Um, there's some real people, there's some real people behind this movie. There's some real, some real stories. And there's an intersectionality. I think that's important to also talk about. There's an intersectionality of cultures, right? We have, we honor the experience of the Asian American community who are hurting so hard right now. And it's so heartbreaking because it's just, <laughs> to take a line from, from our film, it's just not fair, you know? Um, so we're, we are honoring their experience in this film. There's a, there's a version, there's a, there's a storyline of, of an African-American character's entrepreneur played, played brilliantly by Cranston Johnson, who's just a revelation. The second he walked into set, we were all like really tired. And then he showed up for his like two days and he kind of invigorated everybody back again because his, he just showed up with so much gravitas and so much power. Um, and I feel really lucky that's like on such a small movie, all of these amazing people decided to come here because they, I, I feel, or I'd like to feel that they saw a version of themselves in the movie. And I hope that the audience sees a version of themselves in the movie. No, it, it's like the, it's like the manifesto of 343 in Paris, where the women came forward and risked uh, prosecution by saying they had a, an illegal abortion. Um, yeah. It's it's taking the the macro and giving it kind of a micro uh, humanistic level of uh, emotional detail so to try and you know to convey that to audiences. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know we had very little time to do it, so the the, the breaking of the fourth wall was the fastest way that we could accomplish that while also serving the story in terms of getting into these into these characters like internal world um yeah a lot of hidden truths a lot of unsaid truths a lot of wounds that i think our parent generation really swept under the rug um in a way to protect us maybe um but in you know in protecting us sometimes we get blinded so i definitely i didn't know any of this stuff before that conversation with my mother and then i had more conversations with other women in my neighborhood and i said okay and fathers mind you fathers fathers and uncles and 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 cousins and brothers right and to this day it's been interesting within my own family the stories that have come out since the movie like more people coming out and saying things that I didn't even know when I had that conversation with my mother um again and it was weird because at first Dylan like I could feel them holding back right I could feel like almost like a shame in it and so I kept pushing, but I'm a little bit <laughs> persistent as I hope people are noticing. Um, I was a little bit persistent and I, I, you know, I was like, this is safe. You just let me know what's happening. And as soon as they started talking, it was like this floodgate opened up, right? Like this floodgates opened up um, about all of the things that they had held back or they had just soldiered on with. Um, 
and it was really I was like wow you guys are this is not all heroes wear capes man it's true I know um, it makes me really it makes me really emotional I'm um, I'm really proud of it that's awesome yeah and all the the outpouring of praise that you've gotten is uh, well deserved so I hope that's a nice uh reward after toiling for years on the for me projects. and for my crew and for my cast for Hadam and Dehelvi this did not happen by itself for Hadam and Dehelvi is one of the most brilliant directors of photography working today and he's also that brilliant behind the camera and the one we've been working together for so long now and one of the wonderful things about that I love working with him is that he he sees the humanity behind all behind the characters that we're trying to create and he also shares my mission of of putting a, a hero's lens on on underrepresented groups right like we shot this on anamorphic lenses we wanted the superhero shots we wanted it to feel bigger than we had the resources to do because so often these characters are not photographed in that light um you know we had and and you know <laughs> it was he, he supported me when i said I want a contemporary lens on an old story. Um, you know, then we had Liz Baca who did our costumes, who's, this was her first movie, her first movie. And she really built the, the, the characters with me from a socioeconomic, a socioeconomic standpoint up, right? Because so many of the times we see this world and it's photographed and it's, it's flower power and, and the hippie movement. And, and, and it's almost like people of color didn't exist in this world. And, how do you participate in America when you don't can't afford to participate in America? So we built it that way. Susan Allegria, I'm sorry, I have to. She's a production designer, and she was educating us because, right? She's like she'd been more around this time period. I mean, not that far, obviously, but she was telling us things that we didn't know. And so it just felt like a it felt like such a great collaboration. I mean, she with what she was given, she did such an amazing job of just, you know, the, 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 the frames are cramped on purpose. They're, they're cramped because we wanna keep you with her the whole time. Like she's trapped and so are you um, as an audience member. And so Susie just really made the most of those frames, right? There's details in there. Um, and John Michael Powell, my editor, who just was like, yep, got it. And, and it was a great collaboration. And then Luis David Ortiz, who's an angel. Um, and I, I'm actually really excited that there's so many men um, that really got it and supported uh, what Lorenza and I and, and the rest of the women on this group. We were 97% um, um, BIPOC and uh, gender fluid crew. Um, and that was really important to me. My company tries to do that all the time, but this time it was like 97%. And I'm going to hit that metric again because it was amazing. And everybody was super family. And the people in San Francisco, like there was, the crew there is, they're good. They're really strong. They're, they, they protected us and they saved us from a lot of like things that could have been really hard. I mean, it seems like you guys had a very well-oiled machine to achieve the level of, uh period authenticity and uh, set decoration for such a um, indie production? We were making the, the honestly, Selena says this in the beginning of the movie and it's true. We were doing, we were making do with what we had, right? Um, I love that you said it's well, well oiled machine because there were definitely some challenges. I mean, we move locations every day, sometimes twice a day, um, just because that's, I, that's just how it worked out. And that was really tough, but I, I mean, everybody, like when I'm saying like the crew and, and the cast and I were very much the collaboration in terms of like, okay, just hold it together because we have this one moment. We have this opportunity that I don't know if it's going to open up again to, to just say what we want to say, whether it's, you know, you know, whether that works for everybody or it doesn't, like we said what we wanted to say. Um, and they all really supported with that. I'm curious about uh, how this is such a personal project uh, inspired by your dialogue with your mom and uh, it has such a, a broad ranging scope of themes and subject matters and types of characters. So I'm curious what um, now that you've had this experience where you think that personal taste meets mainstream appeal as a for an artist. Yeah, oh, I love that question. I love that question. I, I think anything with hearts also gonna translate uh, mainstream, uh, it seems, right? Like even if you're like in the biggest budget 
um, to the smallest budget. If if it if it makes someone feel something, you're you're doing. I think you're doing a good job. Um, this movie is is mainstream. I think it is mainstream. It's universal. Um, it it's a story that we wanted to elevate, right? So like, I, I, I call it out very clearly. I'm like, I'm gonna do this without the resources because I'm not gonna get those right now, but just you wait, give me some resources and there we go. Um, but yeah, I think I'll always lean into heart. And I think that translates whether you're doing a big studio movie or you're doing a small movie or you're doing, or you're doing TV. It's like, if you uh, I think of your, uh, my perspective, um, yeah, I think I, I, I'm really excited to move into, and to, I want to go wherever there's going to be the biggest impact, right? So Lorenza and I were like, we're really interested in having a conversation with the MCU universe about what they're doing. In 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 uh, we're, we're such we're so um, we're so inspired by what they're doing in terms of impact for the world, and we'd be so humbled and so grateful to just be in the room where that stuff is happening. Um, yeah, I definitely want to, I think the next one is going to be really fun. Um, it's going to be really fun and it's going to be bigger. Um, and I think, I, I hope, I, I hope what Women as Losers showed is that we can reach a lot of people. Um, and what you think is a small story is not a small story. Um, and we, yeah, I, I, I'm excited for the mainstream. I don't, I don't, I'm not shying away from it. I'm excited to, to move forward with that. A lot of um, really cool work that's happening, right? I'm seeing it. Like some of my contemporaries are already in that, in that world. Like Chloe Zhao is about to do the Eternals and she, you know, she and I were interns together at Tisch. Um, you know, like Dee Rees is doing great things. Um, Emerald Fennel, I think is incredible. And like her film is very mainstream, right? Uh, it's, it's almost like we're taking our narratives and saying, our narratives are mainstream. Um, and it, I mean, I have so many people to pick from and choose from in terms of like inspiration that I'm not worried, um, I'm not worried about that jump at all. I'm excited about, I'm excited about that jump. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have uh, a last message for uh, both the young men and uh, young women who uh, watch your film, what you hope, you know, if they get one golden morsel of wisdom from it or from you? Hit me with the hard ones. Um, at a screening of the film early, early on, I had a, a man come up to me and ask me a question that still haunts me. He's, he just came up to me and he said, how can I be a better father to my daughter? And I was not prepared for that question. Was not, nobody was more prepared. I was standing like next to Simu and like Lorenza and, and, and uh, our manager, uh, the, Chris Lee, who's fearless. Um, and Alyssa Feldman, who's uh, Lorenza's manager, who's also fearless. Um, and they, you know, from the beginning of this, they were all just like, okay, we're, we're just going to keep going. We're going to keep going. Um, and we're all kind of just like, stopped and you know that moment where everybody just turns to you which is I feel like what you just did to me when it just turns to you what are you supposed to say um I I just said to him listen like you're already well I said to him I think you're already doing it by asking this question um and I think I think what a lot of women it seems like what women are just asking people to do is just listen without defending please just listen and be here with us, right? Like the, the not all men hashtag is that. Um, like, yeah, we know not all men. We know not all men, but a lot of women, you know? And so just listen. Um, we're not trying to attack you. We're not trying to say, you, you know, we don't want this to happen either. We know that you don't want this to happen, but it's happening. So just, if you could just listen to us um, and really sit with us in this pain, we might be able to find our way forward together. So I would say, um, please just listen um, with an open heart and an open mind, and then go home if you can um, with the reflection and just look within, I think, just look, look within um, and see what, what you can do to 
do better, be better, and 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 that's for the women and the men. I, you know, I don't think misogyny is is uh, culturally specific or gender specific, right? It's a learned behavior. Um, so if we could look inside and go, where have I engaged in that learned behavior, and where can I stop? I think that would that would be like life changing. Extremely well said. Yeah, that, that's um that's a beautiful note to end on thank you. Um, thank you for the amazing questions and for and for having this conversation with me i'm so humbled i'm so humbled that this that uh, people's responses so far and that you know they went with me on it you know it's not risks all don't always pan out so i'm just really grateful i'm really grateful. sure but it's a <laughs> testament to your hard work and uh, your heart as you said it's uh, very, the passion is palpable. It's very clear what, um, how much love went into this project. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah, that's for sure. Thank you. And check out Lorenza Izzo and Chrissy Fit. I didn't even talk about Chrissy. My God, Chrissy Fit, what she did in this movie was, ugh, she had a really tough job here and she did it. Like Simu Lu, you all are about to see how incredible he is in like six, seven months. Um, Brian Craig, Stephen Bauer came in, Liza Wheel, Cranston Johnson, like everybody. It's cool to see everybody go f and flourish and doing doing the amazing things because they, they, they are that in spades. Hey, this is Eric from MyOwnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.